boy lies still and sleep It brings me sad to be bereaved If that be silent, I'll be glad Thy I shall consume all this ill-born tune Which you are sent to a name Thy mother's dream, thy father's dream Be great to know Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres across several weeks. Now, we are currently in the midst of exploring the evolution of folk horror, and this is part 11, in which, as you may have guessed from some of those clips in the intro, we are going to be discussing the films of Ben Wheatley, three movies in particular that all make up a kind of really interesting and unusual trilogy of folk horror. That's Kill List from 2011, Sightseers from 2012, and A Field in England from 2013. Now, we are going to be talking about all three of these movies in spoilerific detail. This is your spoiler warning for all three of these movies. So if you haven't had a chance to see these incredible movies, I would urge you all to seek them out. They're really quite special, each one in their own way. Uh, Before we get started, you may have noticed my voice is a little bit croaky. Uh, I'm currently recording this intro from the comfort of my bed post Fright Fest. Uh, It's been an incredible five days of watching back-to-back horror movies, drinking quite a lot of alcohol, and meeting some amazing people. And I just want to say a big thank you to all of the incredible people, listeners of the podcast especially, members of the discussion group that I was able to actually meet and spend that weekend with. It was an absolute joy to meet you all, chat about horror with you all for five solid days. I loved it. I didn't want it to end. Um, And also, just to let you know, we will be doing a Fright Fest episode at some point as soon as I can drag my carcass out of bed and record something with somebody this week then we will be recording a little chat about how the festival went about some of our personal picks and recommendations based on everything we saw so expect that episode to drop at some point in the next few days but for now let's get started with Ben Wheatley so much stuff to discuss three movies to discuss in fact Um, and there was no better person to chat to about these movies than the brilliant Dan Martin Dan, for anyone who doesn't know, although I'm sure you all do, he's been on the podcast before discussing Jallos with me during the Slasher series. He was also here discussing The Changeling and Amityville Horror with me during the Ghost series. He's a co-host of the Arrow Video podcast along with Sam Ashurst, and he's actually worked on two of the three movies that we're going to be discussing this week. So he was the perfect person to speak to. So here we go. Here is my chat with the brilliant Dan Martin. Okay, welcome back to the podcast, Dan Martin. Hello, Dan. Hello. Uh, lovely to be back here with you talking folk horror. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, first of all, what, what are your, I mean, it's a bit of a, a weird one and a lot of people have sort of different definitions and their own definitions of folk yeah. horror, <laughs> what, what is and isn't. But it, just in general, I mean, in terms of what you see as folk horror, are you a fan of folk horror? Um, absolutely. Although I would say that that it's such an amorphous term. Yes. That I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't think it's something where you can say, oh, I like it's yeah. ex- exhaustively. Yes, yes, yes. Um, there are a, a great number of amazing things that mm-hmm. I don't necessarily all agree. I don't necessarily agree that they're all folk horror. No. But I love them, and and some people would and some people wouldn't call them. Yes, that. exactly. That's an, an unhelpful answer. <laughs> no, I think, you know, it's, it's fair enough. I think, you know, uh, the only ones that, you know, obviously are kind of universally thought of as folk horror are those kind of blood on Satan's claw, that yeah, kind of absolutely. early 70s, late Well, that's 60s. the origin of the term, isn't it? Just, yeah. The, just, uh, like a 2004 interview? It was, it was. I think yeah. Jonathan Rigby or somebody. Yeah. Or, yeah. And um, and then obviously kind of got popularised with Mark Gatiss's yes. documentary in yeah. 2010. Um, but interestingly, you know, I think what we're going to be talking about today, I think Ben Wheatley films, whether or not intentionally, I don't know, have kind of, it feel like it feels like they've brought folk horror kind of back to the yeah, foreground. Yeah, I mean, there a were bit. a lot of articles when Kill This first came out. Yeah. He was sort of like, a lot of people, especially in the American press, were talking yeah. about, oh, is this the revival of a type of genre? Yeah. Um, I think that the those the three films we're going to be talking about mm. kind of make one folk horror movie that's, between them. That's what I thought. And I, th- I feel like, obviously, not, again, this wasn't intentional. A little bit like the original Unholy Trinity isn't intentionally yeah. a trilogy. But I think these three work really nicely as a kind of 
one piece yeah. almost, don't they? Yeah, they do. I mean, to be honest, I'd say that uh, Sightseers is the outlier it is. in there. It is. Uh, and part of that is obviously going to be that it's the one that wasn't Just, originally Ben's idea. Yeah. Uh, him and Amy, although they did some passes on the script, uh, particularly Amy, mm. um, it, it was very much a whole project before they came to it. And, yes. and, and like um, High Rise later, um, Ben wasn't the first director attached. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's definitely his film now. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I, I think you watch it and whatever that um, oblique version of mm. his is mm-hmm. uh, you can see it has his um, his tropes on it. it and it's so British isn't it yeah. and and that's that's something I feel like that is a thing with especially his early films is that they have just they capture Britishness so well yeah. it feels like but the they? different sort of different types of Britishness as yes. well which is yes. really nice yeah 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 um, so first of all I mean just because for people that might not know as well because obviously you you do the Arrow video podcast and that kind of thing but yes, also indeed. you work in the film industry and you've yeah. worked with Ben haven't you so just tell me a little bit about that Sort of yeah. background. So um, it was a sort of a, a lucky um, meeting. And by lucky, I mean my wife made it happen. <laughs> um, uh, Jen, who I think you're going to be talking to mm-hmm. as well, um, is a producer. And she was organising a collection of short films for Fright Fest, the London Festival. Yes. Um, uh, that were a tribute to John Carpenter. Because mm. at the time, John Carpenter was going to be coming over and being a special guest. That right. ended up not happening. Oh. And so these felt a bit weird and out of place. Although, <laughs> still very good. Always good to have yeah, a John exactly, Carpenter yeah, tribute. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so she got five uh, working UK horror directors to do short films inspired by films of John Carpenter. Great. Um, and Ben chose Assault on Precinct 13. And yeah, it, it, it sort of was a zombie version of Assault on Precinct 13. Right. And uh, and yeah, I had zero time to prep, and mm. everything had to be made from either molds I already had or like super super simple stuff. Yes, yeah, because just to say you are you are a practical def- uh, practical effects artist, yeah, aren't yeah, you? yeah. So puppets, uh, mm-hmm. prosthetic makeup, mm. uh, creature stuff, although less for Ben. Yeah, uh, the creature stuff. Uh, obviously, we did the dog for High Rise. Nice. Yeah, the, uh, the Afghan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was fun. Uh, but yeah, mostly um, figurative stuff, so body replication and and puppet work. Um, and so yeah we designed a handful of gags and I sort of pitched some stuff to Ben Mm. I I had a rough script from him yeah uh, and I said, okay, well, this could happen here. This could happen here. We do this. So there's a there's an eye pierce, mm-hmm. uh, which is actually on my co-host uh, of the Arrow podcast, Sam. Yeah, uh, plays the first zombie you see on camera. Great. Uh, he's sort of shambling along, and he gets a uh, he gets a Slater's hammer in the eye from <laughs> Meanna Burring. Um, that is brilliant. And then lots of crowd zombies and stuff like that as well. Is this available for anyone? Like, is it is it out it there used anywhere? To be on the see? Fright Fest website. Yeah. Uh, until quite recently, oh. I haven't seen it's not it on for YouTube a while. or anything. There's a weird thing with the rights to it now so right. it can't be reposted but i'm sure it is around probably somewhere a bit of a dig yeah. yes it's really fun <laughs> or, or corner me and i'll show it to you on my phone <laughs> <laughs> so then after that so you you've basically worked on all of his features since sightseers is that right yeah yeah so i've done a few tv things as well mm-hmm. um we did a pilot for a thing called uh sexy lucky winners which was the attempted reboot of shooting stars on another channel because nice. before ben was doing features he used to shoot all the vt for shooting stars nice um so we did that and i blew up uh vic reeves's head mm-hmm. for that. Um, <laughs> did and you then, have anything to do with the doctor who no i didn't do doctor who they probably with, with, with a machine like that millennium they have their effects. own people. yeah did all of yeah. that they're, they're contracted for the for the whole franchise sure so. um and uh very regrettably i haven't been able to do anything on colin uanus either his new film oh uh, just because it's a return to uh the down terrace format right like ah shot in a fortnight super super quick just great. get it done great, and there just aren't any makeup effects fine so yes. it's not like someone else is doing it there just wasn't a need for yeah, anyone exactly. to do it yeah yeah yeah. oh excellent uh okay cool so i mean first of all i just want to ask you because we, we, we're going to be talking only about ben's films really so first of all ben it, does he have a, a style and if so how would you describe ben wheatley a ben wheatley film um so i think the the thing about I mean, he's obviously very disparate in his output. Yeah. Uh, it's all good, I, yeah. I think, and I think a lot of people agree. I, I think the thing that makes stuff his own is there's always, however absurd and weird and out there it gets, it's always locked into realism. Yes. So even like the the floatiest moments of High Rise, when you've got yes. those beautiful shots, like sort of steady coming around the, the corridor, well, easy rigging around the corridor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's still all locked into the real world. Yes. So despite the fact that that's a, uh, a period piece, as is Free Fire, mm. um, like it, it's always about 
realism. And I think that that's one of the things that makes things like Kill List uh, so effective. Yes. Because when folk horror doesn't work, well, when horror doesn't work in general, it's because it's it stops being relatable. Yeah. And just like an audience are going to find a chipped tooth or mm. a paper cut between the fingers yeah. or a, a, something in the eye much more upsetting than a beheading. Yeah. Because how many of us can absolutely actually relate. identify, yeah, yeah. relate with a beheading? We've all stubbed <laughs> a toe. We've all got a paper <laughs> yeah. cut. We've all had something in the corner of our eye. Yeah. Um, and I think that the yeah that the, the the anchor for those films is is often the paper cut. It's mm. the, it's that real life place, and particularly with folk horror, it's the idea that there's even when they go supernatural, which a lot of them do. Yeah, it's the idea that it exists under this sort of like uh, this thin crust of reality. Yeah, and any time the old spirits, the old forces can break through. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I th- I, it's especially kind of, I, I remember thinking, you know, especially throughout his sort of first two or three features, you know, they were like ri- like kitchen sink versions of genre movies almost. You yeah, know, you absolutely. had Down Terrace, then you had Kill List, the kind of the, the horror movie, then you had Sightseers that was like a kind of Bonnie and Clyde, but they all have the, also but this not, kind also of... Also Nuts in May. <laughs> nuts in May. They, yes, yeah. and there's, there's definitely, um, there is a Mike Lee feel to them as well, actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, that the, 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 they feels so real that they almost feel unscripted in the way that the performances work and the way that the writing works. And I know that's not completely the tr- you know the way he works, is it? He doesn't just let them kind of riff and improv. It no, but there's always an off-script take. Yes. Often. Uh, I mean, with something like Hill List, he'd do... They'd go off-script a lot more if there wasn't stuff that needed to be choreographed. So yes. the fights, the action, that kind of stuff. Yes. Obviously, that has to be a lot tighter. Um, but with especially with sightseers, where Alice and Steve were the origin of those yeah. characters, and they've been doing them on stage for a couple of years mm. before it even went to Big Talk, mm-hmm. and then it stayed with Big Talk for years before Ben came on board. So they were very much though they were those characters. Yeah. So it was very easy to let them do a pass and sort of play around with it. Yeah. To the extent that I was getting, um, I'd get emails from Ben saying, "Oh, we're thinking of adding this thing. How long would it take to make this?" Yeah. So you know, the, there was a very um, in the moment type of filmmaking with mm-hmm. it, which I liked. I think it. it it lends to the film. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and so Ben and his wife Amy are kind of a, a bit of a writing directing team, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. So she, she does she do pretty much all of the writing for what he then directs. Yeah, I mean to be honest, I don't I don't know where the division is as far as ideas. Yeah, my understanding has been that Ben is often uh, comes up with an idea and then maybe does a first draft mm. and then sort of hands over to Amy. Um, he's like he's done versions of films that he's directed yeah. like he's written versions of films that he's directed that he's then taken his name off the script because Amy has done so much re- rewriting on it or yeah. has, has made it her own so heavily yeah. uh, and I think that that very like sparky back and forth dialogue is very much hers right. uh, that, that is the thing like often the scripts do so much of the lifting Yeah, and like he knows what he wants he's got a fantastic cinematographer he's got a fantastic screenwriter He's, yeah, he's lucky. <laughs> he seems like a very, you know, because I've interviewed him a couple of times before, he's so kind of chilled and yeah. relaxed. Uh, is that kind of what he's like to work with from your experience? Yeah, I've never seen him get sort of like het up or angry mm. on set, which is is very nice. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it, does he kind of, is he quite sort of fast and loose then with the way he shoots things and the way he... Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, you'll, you'll notice a lot of handheld kind yes. of feel in yeah. things. Uh, and it's... Uh, and some scenes don't need that, and that's not what he's doing. Mm. But he, his background before he was doing much else, he was doing sort of like viral videos for YouTube. Yeah. He was just publishing stuff online, um, and to fit in with that world, mm-hmm. he was doing because before that he worked in visual effects. He's got a digital effects background. Yeah, he worked at Molinaire. So the idea that he he could make something. He could recognise all the tropes of real life footage. So yeah. he's, he's never made a found footage movie, and he's not a big fan of found footage yeah. movies per se. But he introduces some of the tropes that, whether the audience realise it or not, yeah. of, of from found footage films that kind of trick the audience into thinking stuff's real. So that yes. famous hammer scene in Kill List, yes, is unflinching, but it's. It, the, the camera feels like it's it's there with it, and that's actually you know obviously totally. it's an effect, but he uses visual style to trick the audience into feeling like it's real. Yes, so everything he, feels immediate. Exactly. Yeah, and so even though we've got those, uh, you've got those moments where, um, like the, the audience is has to willingly 
go on this journey. Like, no one thinks people died for these films. No. But you can hit these sort of, like, subconscious buttons that, yeah. that mean that the willing suspension of disbelief is so much easier. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, he's not... I don't know whether he's necessarily known for being a horror director, but he does it bloody well. Like, it's yeah. that trick that we've talked about with, you know, some of the great movies, that he does hit something in your subconscious, I yeah. feel like, with Kill List and, and with certain images and moments in a field in England as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. Where you just, you you know, it just completely gets gets you to your core somehow. Field in England is my favourite. Yeah. Of all of his films. Yeah. Um, and actually that one, despite what we were just saying, that one actually feels in some ways more mannered, more stylized, and less immediate. Oh, absolutely. With it? its tableau work yeah. and the fact that he's gone for something black and white. A lot of kind of locked off camera shots for that. And, it, you know, it feels... Yeah, I mean, there is a, it's still a lot of easy rig work. Mm. So Laurie, who's been cinematographer, and is yeah. just an amazing cinematographer, and yeah. I, I think is uh, shooting the remake of Pet Cemetery at the moment. Oh, is he? Amazing. Very cool. Um... Uh, yeah, so uh, I, for your audience who don't necessarily know what an easy rig is, an mm. easy rig is a backpack that has an arm that comes up over the head of the camera operator and yeah. then has a, a, a sprung wire mm. that comes down and takes the weight of the camera. Yeah. So it allows you to move a huge digital movie camera as though it was ri- very light. Yeah. So you get a much more fluid movement and you can go for much longer handheld shots that would be possible actually handheld. Mm. But it doesn't have the rigidity of being on sticks or on a tripod and it doesn't have that sort of like slightly unnatural floatiness of a steady cam. Yeah. So while Ben will, when he sees it as beneficial to the film, use say a Technocrane like he did quite a lot in Free Fire. Yeah. Um, or steady cam. Uh, he, he the majority of stuff tends to be easy rigged. Yeah, yeah. It's very, I mean it's brilliant. It, it, but you could you can see especially cuz I watched all three, you know, the last couple of days almost back to back really. And it did it you know, they all have this kind of weird mishmash of tones and everything Absolutely. else. But Fields in England did feel stylistically so different to the yeah, previous. Yeah, well, it's it's the one where he has imposed a world on the audience much yeah. more. And I think if you're if you're using them as a recipe for one folk horror movie mm. then that is the folk like yeah the, the vast majority of the folk work yeah. comes but even with that it it ties into this uh, idea that folk horror is about uh, a previous other mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. even though it's set in the past the, the the stuff they're talking about with the alchemy and the fairy rings yeah you know reese's character is a religious man mm. and and alchemy is the science of the time and yeah. they, he wants to be moving forwards yes but all of this stuff with the with the the uh, psychosyllabin mushrooms and all that kind of stuff is yeah. pulling him back towards the past yeah. and eschewing christianity and yeah. ignoring the science of the future and so it's about him being on a knife edge between the past and the f- and the present exactly the past and the future um it's fascinating i mean we'll, and we'll get to that film in more depth but actually i want to ask you yeah that you know this idea of um the past and and the present and that kind of thing is obviously a big part of folk horror and you know what what is it about folk horror that that you know that scares us do you think i mean if you take the ones that we all definitively agree are folk horror like the wicker man for example for a vast majority of the wicker man it's actually quite light and uh, you know and, and, until the sort of real shit goes down in the last yeah, act but I mean, yet there's still this kind of atmosphere and it's the same with a lot of yeah it's yeah. the same with a lot of wheatley movies as well it has this tone or... there's yeah i mean obviously a lot of that so martin pavey's the guy that does ben sound mm-hmm. he's done all of them um Doctor Who notwithstanding. Mm-hmm. And uh, M- Martin does a fantastic soundscape. Yeah. Uh, w- rewatching Kill List again ahead of this and, uh, and Field in England as well. And, well, and, and like all three of them. Yeah. The is. There's, um, there's a lot of drone work going on in the yeah. audio. Um, and it's about building discomfort and unease. Yeah. I think a lot of the stuff, so Wicker Man, for example, is about the idea that everybody else is in on something that you're outside yes. of. Whereas you consider yourself the part of the norm, yep. part of society, but then there's this other thing that may be bigger than that, mm. and it's got it in for you. Yeah. And that I think that that plays into the roots of um, of folk horror. Yeah. Because folk like you know folk music all these things they hark back to an older yes. time it's basically it's, it's it's bringing out some sort of fear of the old or something well, isn't absolutely. it absolutely you horror. think about christian churches were always built on mm. old pagan churches yes. because it was a it was a one two like a double whammy of getting rid of the old and then turning up yes. and then christianity would absorb their holidays and be like oh yeah okay no 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 it's you know it's not 
you know, whatever the old pagan thing yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now oh, it's, it's Easter, yeah. which is uh, that <laughs> yeah. actually, oh, you know, a funny thing. I know it lines up with what you were doing, but actually it's when uh, it's actually Christ about was reborn. Yeah. So it's, it's that, like, you know, it's not a fertility festival. It's yeah. about the rebirth of the son of the Lord. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's in, in Wicker Man, um, the... Um, the policeman sees that the Christian church has sort of like fallen out of use yeah. and has become a, kind a of pagan ruins. space. Yes, it's flipped. and it's and it's yeah, it's the reclaim and it's mm. the idea that maybe these old things have a claim mm-hmm. that we've usurped. You've also got to remember that in this sort of like awareness of post-colonialism, mm. you know, England has had gone around the world just claiming shit. Yeah. Uh, and I think the 60s and 70s when folk horror started to happen, although even though it wasn't necessarily acknowledged at that yeah. time, that was also around the time that we started to like go, yeah, maybe we were a bit badly behaved. <laughs> yeah, as, a, as a culture, we were looking back on it and feeling a bit sheepish about yeah. it. Um, and it's the idea that, oh, well, there are these previous occupants that yeah. actually have a claim over this space yeah. and we are the imposters. Yeah. So I, I think it, yeah, it, it ties into a lot of um, uh, a lot of feelings of of upset and, and yeah. unrest and um, and guilt. And then on top of that, especially in the seventies, like you know, post flower power and all of the yeah. like sexual liberation, uh, the seventies became a much darker time. All all the other films that were being made suddenly got very grim and dark. Yeah, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot very of realism. realistic as well. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think that. Um, the the folk horror stuff a lot of that was a, a reference to the sort of the flower child stuff of the 60s yes particularly uh, blood on satan's claw i mean yeah. it's like the scary youth and the you know the... absolutely well that's it because in in uh, in folk horror traditionally when you have youth they are either innocence yet to be corrupted mm-hmm. or oh my fucking god what are these kids doing <laughs> that's that? terrifying yeah exactly there's always going to be uh, a connection between what's going on mm. and and why people are making the films they're going to make particularly with Within horror and sci-fi, yeah, both of which are sort of reactionary genres. Always, um, and so yeah, I think it's 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 very it, it's impossible to divorce the idea of of folk horror and its current resurgence from what's going on. Yeah, we are you know in England we're trying and folk horror has always been quite a predominantly English genre. Yeah, although there are things there are definitely things from outside of England that that fall into the category. Yeah. Um, but as England tries to make itself more and more insular and shut itself off from the outside world, yeah. I think it's a yeah, it's a solid reaction because yeah. it, it 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 kind of appeases both sides of the argument as well. It does. You can see people who maybe want to hold themselves off from the outside world. It's the same as Americans making constant movies in the early thousands where young, fresh faced Americans go somewhere and the foreigners are bad. Exactly. <laughs> which was all about the Middle East conflict. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, Hostel is a perfect example of that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's kind of like, because America doesn't have the same history yeah. and also culturally hasn't necessarily fully come to terms with how badly they fucked over the indigenous peoples. No. Although you did have the um, uh, Indian burial ground wave of the late 70s. <laughs> God, hundreds of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they're always but, just like a comment in passing. Well, yeah, exactly. But, yeah. but it was just a sort of excuse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But I don't think it's really been addressed as much. And it'll it'll happen, I, I expect. But so I think their, yeah, their folk horror is still outward. Mm. They still see it as, well, and, and also to an extent the cannibal movies as well of Italy in the 70s. Cannibal movies, absolutely. All kind of fit into the same. It's those kind of, those, those ideas of kind of, you know, we talked about it as well, actually, within this series, whether or not they're folk horror necessarily but as interesting spins on them of those kind of uh uh, exploitation, as some people might yep. call them, yeah, yeah, yeah. insular communities, arrogant young people uh, sort of stumble upon this kind of old traditional community yeah. and and suffer the consequences. Well, exactly, it's about realizing suddenly you're the outsider. Yes, you you're, you come from a place of privilege. You come from a place where you're the norm, whether it's Christianity mm-hmm. or the big city or whatever. Yeah. and you end up somewhere, and oh fuck, these people all worship a, an old sun god <laughs> yes, or a, exactly. you know a, a, a British thespian in a dress. Yes, like, yes, exactly. <laughs> You know, or, uh, you know, they just eat people. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You know, whatever. (laughs) 
first of all, Dan, could you could you do the honours and give us a little a little plot, plot synopsis of Kill List? Uh, absolutely. Um, so Jay and Gal, our two leads, are uh, men who seem to know each other from the military. Jay has been off work for eight months, and uh, he and his wife have kind of got through the money he had saved up. Uh, he says it's for a bad back. We later find out it's perhaps because something went down that he is now yes. keeping him away from work on a psychological level. Uh, and his uh, friend Gal, played by Michael Smiley, um, comes to him with some work to sort of get him back in the saddle, as mm-hmm. it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it turns out that A, he's a, essentially a contract killer, yeah, uh, and B, that his wife knows what he does and is is uh, accepting of it. Yes. So he uh, he takes the job and things aren't on what they appear. And mm. how spoilery are we going? We, we, I mean, we, we will go full spoilers, you, but, but that's fine just for a plot setup. That's yeah. absolutely fine. But we will go full spoilers because there's so much good stuff to talk about, especially in the final act for this film. Yeah. Um, I mean, so first of all, what, what were your reactions to this? You know, this one you didn't work on. So I can ask you as Dan, the, the Arrow Video podcast host, and not Dan, the practical effects uh, <laughs> yeah. artist who worked with Ben. I mean, what were your what are your thoughts on this film? I'm, I absolutely love it. Yeah. I absolutely love it. Um, so I'd done the short film with Ben before I saw this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Andy Stark, Ben's like one of the co-owners of Rook Films, mm-hmm. uh, Ben's company, um, invited me to the cast and crew screening. Oh, great! So because it hadn't actually come out at that point, yeah, uh, it had done the festival circuit and the buzz was happening, but it hadn't been released to the public. Um, so I went along to it and I left with my jaw on the floor. Oh. Um, just amazing, and I couldn't wait to see it again. Um, I saw it at the cinema when it came out. The cinema, mm. I bought the Blu-ray when it came out. I've seen it maybe half a dozen times. Yeah, um, I really, really like it. When we when we're done, here, yes. By the way, uh, I have on my computer, and I will show you the first like five or ten minutes of it. Uh, a thing that I call list kill, which is um, uh, kill list folded over itself. Ah, so I've yes. taken kill list, flipped it, laid it with a fifty percent opacity over the top of itself. Yes, with the sound mixed in, and it's. It's beautiful the way the film mirrors itself. Well, I've, I've heard, yes, I've, I was going to ask you about this. Ben has, Ben told me this, and in, in, when I interviewed him about it, that he said that it, it is two halves folded so over shock, each other, which is appropriate because it's about you taking your own. It's deliberately slightly oblique. Mm-hmm. It's about you seeing in it what you want to see, which is, you know, to jump forward to. Um, uh, to Field in England a little mm. bit is a black mirror is a scrying yeah. glass held up to you so you see your innermost fears mm-hmm. the inspiration of the film and at least initially for Ben was about uh, was were nightmares it had recurring nightmares it had as yeah. a child um, and the idea that he works on these universal upsets worries fears mm-hmm. um, so by leaving it a little bit oblique yeah. you let people impose upon it the worst possible outcome yes. the worst possible thing yes and it feels like that it feels like you're watching your own nightmares play out in some weird yeah, way it's uh, gorgeous it, even though it's so kind of specific to these characters it's wonderful um, yeah and it's it's interesting because you know it, when he told I had never heard about this until um, I interviewed him and he told me about this kind of this the way it's kind of got this kind of two half structure because yeah. I've always thought of it in my head as very much a, a, a piece of three acts I suppose oh it is it's the speed of horror films yes <laughs> yes it is exactly and the way that it moves it's almost like three different films of different genres yet somehow it works so organically and, and so fluid but it's it's you know the way that it sort of starts as this kind of kitchen sink family drama into this kind of hitman thriller and then into this proper I guess you'd call it folk horror you yeah. know in the final act yeah I mean moves. Ben people often uh, often sort of like make reference to it he's always quick to point out there's more Alan Clark uh, yep. that he draws from yep. obviously when we think of Alan Clark we tend to think of things like scum and yeah uh, Absolutely, but actually, he did a little bit of folk horror himself in mm. um, Fender's Pen. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which you know is is as it, it, it's not super traditional. No, 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 folk horror, and it's um. But we've yeah, we've talked about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I think that there's um yeah, there's a sort of a crossover there as well, and it is about that discomfort and the realism and the grind, mm. and then slowly pulling away the supports of what you're comfortable with. Because the thing is, especially in England, we're very comfortable with gangster films, and, yeah. and Neil had a background in that kind of stuff as well. Done a lot of gangster movies, yeah. Um, and so we're kind of com- even though it's like quite extreme, mm-hmm. it's quite it's familiar ground yeah and then to slowly pull away the supports yeah until the whole thing's like falling apart yeah and it's just all gone to fuck <laughs> yeah yeah I do remember the first time watching it though being you're right because it is a it is a genre we're all familiar with and comfortable with at least at the beginning and yet I still felt so 
uncomfortable and oppressed and almost like I was watching a horror film just when they're sat around the dinner table. Oh, that fight at the dinner table is absolutely it's amazing. incredible. But that's, I mean, I think that's all the actors as well. I mean, oh. They're so good. So what do you do for your own? <laughs> Human resources. Hatchet man. Sorry. Hatchet person. <laughs> what is it? I mean, what does that entail? Mm. If there's a department that's underperforming, then I go in and assess the extraneous manpower and the force accordingly. I waited for a comment. <laughs> I know there's one coming. You call it sack people. <laughs> it's not personal. Well, it's probably personal to them. Their families. It was the last time you cared about the welfare of a family. Hmm? Oh, yeah, I know. Eight months ago. <laughs> Apparently they shot the um, the dinner party up until when the fight breaks out. Mm. They, they actually just had a dinner party. Yes, and So yes. they shot it in real time and then chopped it down. Yes. Um, and Rob Hill, who cut the film with Ben, yeah. um, says there's a, a much longer version of the film that's much funnier. Oh, interesting. Um, and that when they finished editing the film, Ben turned to him and said... Well, we've made a hilarious comedy. Let's cut out all the jokes and make it horrible. <laughs> right. That's really interesting. Because, yeah, because, you know, I know that Ben has said that kind of every element of this film, everything is designed to make you scared or uncomfortable, basically. That's it. And it's there's everything that happening. long... The, there's a lot of long pauses. There's yeah. a lot of things holding slightly too long. It, yeah. it, it does take all of those... And, and Ben... Ben is a very knowledgeable director. He knows about yeah. film as well. Uh, he comes to this from a place of education. Mm -hmm. And he... Uh, he has managed to take the tropes used by a lot of different directors yeah. and, and weave them together very efficiently. Yeah, totally. you're right. And it's got that kind of almost kubrick -and kind of feel to yeah. it where it's like, yeah, this kind of horrible sort of dread that builds throughout yeah. or Lynch or something like that, you know, that kind of... Yeah, there's, it's got a slightly lost highway feel in places. Yeah. And, yeah. That, I mean, it's one of the first truly, like, chilling moments is when um, she, Gal's girlfriend, goes up to the bathroom, takes off the mirror, and, and she steals the, the... steals the tissue with his blood on it. Yes! The blood sacrifice. Steals the bloody tissue, then scrawls that symbol. Yeah. As in your, it's, that, it's that first kind of real what-the-fuck moment, isn't it? And she accepts the sacrifice... He accepts the sacrifice from them because he assumes it's from the cat when he eats the rabbit. Oh, yeah, of course. Which is oh, obviously yeah, the, the cult it. killed the yeah. thing and they give it to him and he willingly takes the flesh. Yeah. So it's like a, like an unholy Eucharist. Yeah. Like, drink, eat, eat of this for this is my flesh and they've given him this symbolic oh, That's really interesting. Yeah, I didn't even think about all this, it. that he's yeah. willingly kind of participating in all these kind of rituals, I but suppose, But it's because throughout. of... It, and, you know, to some extent, it's this sort of, like, toxic masculinity where yeah. he's all like, oh, you know, fuck, I'm going to throw it away. I'm going to eat this. Yeah. You know... Put Sit in the onions. garden by myself. Yeah, and, and yeah, his wife says, this is disgusting, you're not cooking yeah. it in my kitchen. He does cook it in the kitchen, but he's not allowed to eat it in the house. <laughs> yeah. And he sits there pointedly eating it in a deck chair in his garden, <laughs> locked in eye contact with Miana. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a horrible character, horrible man. Can't mama, can you sluta? Jag ringer bara för att prata om mig. Jag vill inte att du ska säga åt mig hela tiden. Um, their relationship at the beginning, um, Jay and his wife, I mean, it's, what, do you know what it is that she says when she's on the phone? No, I actually tried to look it up. Me too, and no um, one seems to... It no, no one's acknowledged it. No. I, 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 I feel Is anyone like... out there listening who knows what that what it is she says? Because she's talking in Swedish, yes. isn't she, on the phone? And I, I wondered if it was a clue in any way. Or... Yeah, I don't know if it's if it was even scripted yeah no um, or if it's or if it, she was just told to say something like you know she's complaining to her mum about her husband but yes. who knows maybe it's a military friend back yes. in Sweden well I read on the IMDb trivia for it which isn't always true but it, that, that she she completely made that up and that okay. no one on set even knew what it was she said but who knows so it might have just been something very it's kind not of like mundane the thing where it yes <laughs> if you speak the language it spoils the movie they tell you what happens yeah, yeah brilliant yeah that's it's brilliant. not a dog it's an alien <laughs> that can look like any of you you should kill it immediately otherwise you'll end up with everything on fire mostly dead <laughs> that's brilliant oh that is amazing uh yes i heard you guys discussing that on yeah. the arrow podcast that's so good um yeah and then i mean moving into the second act it when it gets kind of super violent as well yeah. i mean what are your thoughts especially as a practical effects artist i mean some of those um it's it's like you say it's unflinching isn't yeah. it those death scenes yeah i mean that's definitely ben um, yeah there when i when i did the zombie film with ben uh the zombie short yeah uh, first time i'd worked with him we had a bunch of practical effects but we'd not met even at that point we just yeah. spoken on the phone spoken via email 
Um, and the first gag we shot was the head crush. Mm. Uh, and it was a Fright Fest regular called Paul Ewan who came in to play the, the zombie. And Paul mm. does quite a lot of modeling for the makeup effects schools. Mm-hmm. So he'll often uh, get stuff. But it wasn't his head. We hadn't. I didn't have a live cast of Paul. So that right. head was actually Peter Pedrero, the stunt guy who later gets hit with an axe. Right. Okay. So, yeah. it, I mean, you know, they're both bald men of a certain age. So <laughs> yeah. it, it was... I said, to, I said to Ben, is this going to be all right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. And it was always going to be a hybrid effect between practical and digital work. Mm. So we shot that just before lunch. And then over lunch, he did a slap comp mm-hmm. of, uh, of the effect where he used... Um, uh, used just After Effects on his laptop to stitch it together, and he just uh, called me over and, and pressed play on his uh, on his laptop, and I watched like in one shot Paul get pushed to the ground, and then someone stamps on his head and it bursts like a melon. Amazing, and it's beautiful because you know the the practical effect I had made that head didn't look like Paul until it was falling apart. Yeah, and Ben stitched it together because you know like I said he had his background uh, in visual effects. Oh, that's so interesting. from yeah. then on, it was it was an amazing luxury to be able to design. And I've taken this to other jobs, and I've done this with other departments. Um, but it's yeah, it's an amazing luxury to be able to sit down and talk with the VFX team and the director and go, look, this is where my work goes, and then they take over, and then I can build these elements, and they can use that, and mm-hmm. stuff. and to be able to bring all those different tools together just gives you these amazing things that you can't show any other way but it's still largely practical yes they're not it's all, still all physical elements that's really interesting yeah because it, it gets me every time that moment i've watched the film probably about five times now and when he hits that when he beats that guy with the hammer yeah and the way it just it doesn't cut away and you just see his head just kind of get yeah. mashed to a pulp in yeah, front yeah, of you yeah. um what do you think is then what do you think is the actual kind of story? Or what's really going on in this film with these characters and this list? Do you think? I, what's your theory? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give a loose theory. Yeah, I'm not gonna be too specific because I think the film is better if you haven't been told. Sure. Um, so do you actually kind of know from Ben? Sort of. No, he's never been. He's never been super explicit. I've spoken to him enough that I think I have a vague. Mm-hmm. Like a really loose authority. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. at all. I'm just guessing. Um, but but the thing is that it. I think the film works because you impose your own absolutely thing on yes. it, and confusion or or the gaps that are left in your understanding of it are part of that. Yeah. Uh, and it's like it's like a like an eighties monster movie. Yeah. It can be super scary until you see the movie until you see the monster. Yeah. And when you see it, when you know, yes, it's like oh yeah. yes, that's true. Well, let me. I mean, what I make of it is that. That that everything that they're obviously all these people they're killing is all part of some kind of initiation for Jay, where they want him in some sort of almost like some sort of deity figure in their cult, and maybe something happened in Kiev that that is what sparked this off. I do know what happened in Kiev. Do you? <laughs> can, you say, can you say or not? Uh, I'm not going to say. Oh. But what I will say is that we almost made a short film as part of the publicity for the film oh, when it came Kiev. out of the States of what went down in Kiev. Oh and so I have the script and the storyboards that we never shot. It. But do you know what? But with, in, <laughs> with, with that, in that regard, I'm kind of glad and I agree with you that that is... Almost the way they talk about it, or the way they don't talk about it, is it must be it must be something so dark and horrific. It's illusion. Yes, it has yes. to be. It has to be something. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's like when he watches the horrible child porn. I can only assume tape, and you only hear yeah, it. Yeah, and you hear those screams, and you see his well, incredible it. reaction. Um, Maskell, is it? Yeah, Neil Maskell. Neil, yeah, in Neil Maskell's it, yeah. performance while he's watching well, because it because Michael turns it off immediately. Yes, and says, "You don't want to see that, mate." Yes, uh, and. Neil goes, well, I've fucking got to watch it now. Yeah. And then you just see a really long shot of him, like, openly crying in front of this monitor that you can't see while you hear these screams that might be a a woman, might be a child. sound design in this film is as we mentioned already is just incredible at building that dread as well isn't it and 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 those moments like that when you hear things but you don't see them it just makes it so much more horrific and again like we mentioned this is you know this this moment between him seeing this video and then the the hammer kill this is the kind of turning point isn't it this is when everything starts to descend and we we get towards that third act 
and I think then we're we're in real kind of horror film territory, aren't we? Where we we discover that these people that he's killing are all part of some sort of sect or something. Uh, there's that moment when they're out at night in the middle of the night and they see this 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 hanging of this woman and all these people in sort of cloaks and masks, and 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 that's the point when we're like, oh, okay, this is no longer a, a a sort of hitman thriller. We're in a proper proper horror movie now from this point onwards. And at this point, we understand and comprehend so little, which. Again, Again, like we mentioned, it just makes it that much more terrifying. Yeah. One of the things I, I always liked about it that I, people don't seem to talk about mm. um, is the woman who hangs herself in front of uh, oh my God, Jay yes. at the end. Because she's, she's wearing a dress made of money. Is she? I yeah. didn't notice it's that. All, it's all 50 and 20 pound notes, huh. her entire dress. And money and capitalism being the future force. Yes. And it's about the exercising of the modern mm. desire for that kind of stuff. And, and this is where the real... Enforcement sort of, of rurality. Yeah, and that's where the real folk horror element comes yeah, into it, absolutely. isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, people don't talk about that. I like the imagery of the wind turbines yes. at the beginning. Uh, the, the big kickback in the conservative rural areas of England mm. is like relatively well-off landowners complaining that yeah. the uh, countryside is being ruined by the modernity of these wind turbines, which are entirely so that we can enjoy the oh, yeah. environment for longer because the world isn't a burning hellscape. Yes, yeah, God, I didn't even <laughs> so think about that. the idea yeah. of that being an image of... Uh, yeah, of of uh, the the imposition of modernity onto this beautiful yeah. like idyll. You know, let's just talk about that final act then. I mean, because I I have spoken to some people who actually for them it loses it in the final act when yeah. it goes out and out horror. I suppose that's but that that's always going to be the way. Yes, you, there's there's nothing extreme whether it's content wise or idea wise mm -hmm. that isn't going to lose some people totally yeah. and i would i'd much rather not be on board with some films but yeah. be as heavily on board with others yeah because that dichotomy exists yeah because people are making those kind of bold choices yeah than have everything be like warm middle of the road pap Absolutely. where everybody's fine with it because nothing's problematic yeah totally <laughs> and and for me i i love the last act I mean, oh I yeah think absolutely it's absolutely terrifying that's well that's it i speak from a position of luxury because <laughs> i got the whole film and i really yes. enjoyed it but just like oh, tension uh, yes, the way yes. like loads oh, of people kicked people. back against the ending of that I actually quite yeah. like the ending because it's silly yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but it, it felt like that was kind of what it was building towards and it took it, like when I first watched it I did have a what the fuck what <laughs> yes moment. Like, well, you watch it, it again a little bit let down, but you watch it again and actually the whole film is building to that like it, it is. all feels I agree yeah, yeah. definitely really well paced those kind of chase scenes through the tunnels and, yeah. and you know again sort of horrible nightmare oh, those stuff. bits where they're where they're running at them and they're they're lit by the muzzle flash of oh. the shotgun as, as gals yes. like shooting down the naked cultists yeah. until eventually they he can't hold them off any longer and they eviscerate him oh. it's absolutely amazing and the, 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 the sounds they make these kind of animalistic screams yeah. or demonic screams yeah. or something that they make as well <laughs> There's a um, there's a shot in uh, Takeshi Kitano's brother mm -hmm. um, of a shootout in a garage, and it's all one high angle shot, and the lights go out, and you it's entirely lit by the muzzle flash of the people shooting at each other across this space. I've always really enjoyed that, and this kind of reminded me of that, but also in that kind of like horror computer game gauntlet kind of environment. Yes, exactly, exactly. Where it's just this onslaught of attack, and you're yeah. in a very confined space. And then the very kind of end image then, I mean, we've briefly talked about it already, but again, you know, what what are your thoughts on that ending and the, how... The crown or the whole, the whole the, thing leading the, up to the The whole crown? thing, the fight with the hunchback to the reveal to the crown. Um, I love it. Yeah. I, absolutely, I love it. I mean, I'm, I find as I get older, I don't have any kids, but mm. a lot of people my age, a lot of my friends are having kids mm. and a lot of them are souring <laughs> yeah. to like this kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, now I've got a new perspective on the value of life and... <laughs> And I'm finding that I have fewer and fewer friends with whom I can share this kind of stuff. But what's amazing is that Ben has a kid. Ben had a kid when he made that yeah. 
when he made that uh, that film, and he it, that was born out of what's the worst thing that could happen? Well, exactly, and and, that, and that's why he put it in the film, and that's amazing. It is, it is, it's supposed to be the ultimate nightmare situation. Yeah, isn't you don't it? you don't get on a roller coaster because you want a, a yeah a tame experience, a bus or, ride. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the only bit that always gets me at the end is when the wife is smiling. Yeah, so uh, Ben did specifically go on record and say she's not part of the cult. Okay, So okay, that has been, that, okay. that is official. Okay. Um, he says she's laughing at the irony of it because she can't see him as well, mm, mm-hmm. just as he can't see her. She's under the blanket. She doesn't know it's him attacking right. her. Right, okay. So her laughing is, oh, fuck, of course. Okay, okay. Rather than because she was part of it. This is yeah, I, I can see how people think that maybe more people were involved in it yeah uh, because because you've you, you know she's an interesting character she's this quite enigmatic character and you don't yeah. know really what her background well is. and gal saying thank you before he gets killed yeah. by Matt Skull, which r- mirrors all of the people who but again that's more like uh do you see house the old, yeah. yeah the guy who asked to be killed in vietnam and then like <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah he didn't yeah. kill him so now he's haunting him yeah it's that like he's like put me out of my misery i don't want to be taken by yes these people. exactly and that's why he's saying thank you but like everything else in the film it's a mirror so it's representative of the other thing it mm-hmm. doesn't mean that he's part of the other thing so he's the other side of that looking glass of that coin yeah because actually gal is the what the only character really that i 100% trusted in the whole in the whole film I suppose but so just again explain this a little bit more for people like this kind of midway point or the way that this film kind of folds then what, what does that mean so the, the 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 and this is a theory that's been stated about The Shining as well yeah. if you watch the director's cut of The Shining but it's that if you take the film reverse it and then play it over the top of the other yes uh the, the the normal version, the forwards version of the film, mm-hmm. that you will see referential imagery mm. crossing over in the time frame between wow. the two up until the midpoint, and then it reverses itself and and, and undoes itself in the other direction. Oh my god! Um, and it's yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, and and it, you've done this with Kill List, and it works. I've done this with Kill List. Yeah, I mean, obviously, not absolutely everything. There is a certain yeah. amount of. Uh, world building and stuff that doesn't sure, necessarily sure, sure, sure. match in the same way but key scenes align beautifully it's and what's the satisfying. what's the kind of idea of that then that the second half is somehow like a kind of nightmare version of the first half or something I, mean, I think it's that it's all his own doing right like just like in Wicker Man when they say you had to come here willingly and they yeah. actually give him loads of opportunities to yes. leave at the beginning they're like oh, are you sure you want to come on board yeah. and you, you, maybe if you want to fuck this girl yes, and then he wouldn't be a virgin and be, yeah but he always turns it down and so mm. ultimately he's the one that put himself there mm-hmm. and I think that um, uh, Ben says that the the Obviously, The Wicker Man is one of the films that people often say, oh, well, is it influenced by whatever. Yeah. Ben's feeling is that the influence, at least consciously, uh, is by and large mostly that it's just a noose, a trap, a trap. that's tightening around him. Yeah. Um, and after a certain point, it's inescapable. Now, as far as I'm concerned, it's the midpoint mm-hmm. is when the film becomes inescapable. And that obviously is where those two, the, the overlap comes. So like you open an inkblot test and mm-hmm. you see the, the left-hand side and the right-hand side are a mirror image of one yes. another. That's the film. What is the moment then? What's the actual specific moment that's the halfway point? So it- uh, it's one of the it's one of the killings. Right, 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 um, right, right, right. And I think it might be when he, it might be the hammer killing, but I think it might be the... Yeah, it probably is, isn't it? It might be it, the priest. It, it, it feels like about that, that uh, again, that, that kind of child porn scene is, is kind of like a midway turning yeah. point almost. I've, I've, I've watched the first 10 minutes of it played mm. over itself a lot more than I've watched that whole thing. Sure, sure, it's, sure, of course. It is by and large unwatchable. Yes, <laughs> that yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that sort of thing is fun <laughs> for a few minutes, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, the, uh, it's like the, the Wizard of Oz dark side of the moon thing. Do you remember yeah. that? Where yeah. it was like... You Absolutely, watch them sync up, but it was good for like the first five minutes, and that was it. But wonderful. So you know, a big recommendation. I mean, hopefully, if everyone's listened to this, they've seen it because we've gone into deep spoiler territory. But uh, a big recommendation from you then for Kill yeah, List. very much. Yeah. Show me your world, Chris. Well, I thought we'd start with Christ Tram Museum. Great, dear Mum. Yorkshire is lovely, not like you said at all. They can smile. And they do sell my pasta sauce. The caravan bed is quite short, but Chris is a sensitive lover. <laughs> Hope you can be happy for me. Love, Tina. Yeah, good girl. You are going to pick that up. 
I didn't do that. If you don't pick up this excrement immediately, then I'm going to have to inform the National Trust. <laughs> Report that to the National Trust, mate. Um, so, Sightseers is uh, about Tina and Chris. Tina is a... Um, uh, a woman who has been sheltered from the world lives with her slightly possessive and protective mother. Mm -hmm. um, she has met a, uh, a ginger face man yeah. uh, called Chris who offers her a, an exit, a, a way out. Um, but her world is so small and petty that he, she doesn't see how small and petty he also is. Yes. So when he takes her away for her first weekend off to the most parochial corners of the British tourist mm. world, uh, the Kreutz Tramway Museum and yep. the, the Pencil Museum and all that kind of stuff, um, she uh, she goes along with him. And those places are, are lovely, but they're sort of like, they're laughably... Quaint. Co yeah, colloquial British. Yeah. Um, uh, and then it turns out that he is—he has anger issues, much like uh, much like Jay mm, yeah. in Kill List. Um, he has this—he has the kill switch. Yes. Um, uh, and then that is further turned on its head when he realizes that she's not only okay with it, but actually she's more chaotic, yes, and more problematic than it with it with him. My favorite, second favorite moment in the film uh, is uh, after they've just run over the the jogger. Yeah, and. Uh, and he's like, you may even be a witch. Yep, that's it. You're a witch. And he, he fires her from being his <laughs> yeah, girlfriend. <laughs> Brilliant. So obviously, you know, because, you know, obviously everything in Kill List is supposed to make you uncomfortable and scared. It feels like everything in Sightseers is the opposite. I mean, it's supposed to make you laugh. It's a comedy. It is definitely a comedy. It? But I think that because it's a horror comedy. Yeah. Um, and Ben knew that those things had to be kept very ser very, very separate. Mm. Uh, and often with horror comedy, you, the, the, the horror itself is comic. It's the comedy, it's, yeah. It, yeah, and it's ludicrous. And and that's fun. Like, I like that stuff. Yeah. But I also like the division that occurs in, yeah. in Sightseers. And I don't think you see that quite as much. No. Like things that makes it interesting. It's that brilliant, like, it's like American Werewolf in London or some of those where it's like, well, the scary bits are still scary. Yeah. You know, it yeah, still works absolutely. as a horror. It's still problematic. We had, um, when we did our first big, uh, like, sit HOD, uh, head of department sit down mm -hmm. at the big talk offices in London, Yeah, uh, Andy Stark, who I mentioned earlier, the producer, um, pulled me aside and said, okay, Dan, uh, we've got the BFI in today. <laughs> this is serious. Uh, we've got the execs from Big Talk. They're all shitting it because they think we're going to make Kill List too. <laughs> so if they ask you any questions about the effect, try not to use anatomical terms. Try not to laugh. Try not to sound too excited about the death in this movie. <laughs> so I, was, so I, was, I went in and I was sort of like blank and quiet and super professional. That's brilliant. Um, That's didn't, brilliant. Didn't say... Viscera. <laughs> viscera. Because uh, it is visceral. Uh, it so, is visceral you were, yeah. so were you on sort of death duty in terms of creating these kind of corpse yeah, we, type... Yeah, we sort of... Obviously, the the mechanisms for the death mm. were all scripted. Mm -hmm. But then I was given quite a bit of leeway with, with how it was how it was actually done. Yeah. Um, and then we'd sort of sit down and talk about what I'd made and how it would be shot and that kind yeah. of stuff. So so for Tony, for example, the first death, Tony Way, who you see getting reversed over with the caravan. Yes, the, the, the man... He's eating a cornetto, isn't he's he? Eating a which cornetto. I've heard... Which I read is a wink to the fact that exec producer Edgar, Edgar was Roy, on set yes. at that point. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, okay. uh, yeah, so he, uh, so we had uh, Tony came in. Uh, we did a partial life cast of him, made a neck piece. Um, we also did a, a hand. So the hand that's holding the gonk is a puppet mm -hmm. because the caravan wheel is actually parked on it. Nice. <laughs> uh, so the wheel is completely on the thing. And then my assistant, um, Dan uh, Goma, was under the caravan operating the oh, uh, right. hand yeah. like, to let go of the gonk. Yeah. Uh, and then we had bloodlines running up and we'd um I had a I sculpted it so the collarbone had been pushed up and out of the throat. So oh. there's if you if you pause it you can see that the uh yeah, the, 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 the collarbone's been sort of ejected from the neck. Like and it's kind set. of spewing blood yeah, there, and isn't it? it's spraying up into the wheel arch and then dripping back down on Tony's face. Brilliant. I love it. I, lo um, I love. I absolutely love that. And it's the first moment of like, holy shit, you know, this is going to be quite yeah. gr gruesome as well as hilarious because, you know, a lot of films, somebody gets run over, that's all you need to see, really. Yeah, it's a nice scene setter. Yeah. And because it's none of... 
none of Ben film Ben's films that I can think of off the top of my head. This isn't something I've prepped. Um, mm. Have a cold open. They all start in the world and yeah. then you move through. Yeah. So you don't have that. Like oftentimes with a horror film, you'll have that bit before the credits yeah. where you see the the end of the last arc. Yes. Like you know whatever it is, someone being killed at the camp or you know whatever. Yes. Uh, and then you introduce the main characters and you go yes. through all the world building. And it's because someone somewhere decided that audiences couldn't handle not seeing a death for 20 yeah. minutes. Yeah. Um, whereas the worlds Ben builds are interesting enough that mm. they don't need that. Yes, they have that slow build, yeah, don't they? Like we talked really about with Kill that. List. Um, and it is uncom- this film is uncomfortable at moments as well, which is what's brilliant about yeah. it. And oh, these, it really is. These two are hilarious and they are awful people that you would just never want to be around either you know like the moment when they walk into the other couple's caravan and just kind of make themselves at home and feed the dog and, and smash you just a plate. smash a plate and it's like <laughs> oh these people even without murdering they're awful people <laughs> it's such good performances though i mean so this was kind of this was alice and steve's kind of they had been doing these characters for yeah. years yeah, hadn't yeah, they and was it like a it was like a stand it was like a, a performance they did in edinburgh yeah, and yeah they did that kind of thing. And ben came on board amy did a rewrite um, and it, it sort of flowed from there. And, and and the weird thing is with these movies as well is that it still somehow has their thumbprint on it. Oh, even absolutely. though he, he's, you know, they get taken on, like you said, these projects already existed, these characters already existed, and yet somehow it, it fits so perfectly in his catalogue, doesn't yeah. it? That's the thing. Fuck. 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 What is it? Every time I think I've found my oeuvre, someone shits on it. Well, I wouldn't shit on you, Chris. Not unless you ask me to. Everyone else seems to find it so easy to express themselves. I mean, even you've got your knitting, haven't you? But the thing is, Chris, I'm your muse now. And we've got banjo. So everything will be perfect. You just need to be a bit more patient. There's something in me, Tina. I'll help you squeeze it out. When you talk about it in terms of being a folk horror, they are the antagonising force. Mm -hmm. So they represent the outsiders coming into the rural backwaters of England from this, like, you know, sort of suburban terrace where Tina lives uh, and exacting their ill thought out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) There's something authentic about it. And I think that has something to do with being out and about in the British countryside and just sort of having that immediate feel. Yeah, it was. It was a pretty stressful mm-hmm. shoot as far as unit moves go because yeah. we were literally touring Britain. Yeah. Like the entire production <laughs> just had to up sticks and move every couple yeah. of days. Oh, God. So there probably were quite a lot of kind of caravans and yep. trailers and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Was it a good experience for you overall, though, being it, on that? It was amazing. Like, yeah. it, was, it was pretty early in my career. Mm-hmm. It was a, definitely a step up and it was super exciting. Yeah. Um, and it felt a bit like, you know, even though Kill List had made huge waves sightseers felt even more like it had gone into the mainstream well that was it i think it's less alienating than yes. kill list it's much more accessible yes and, and it was an obvious pendulum swing for ben to then ostracize his audience as hard as possible yes which is things. absolutely hilarious because you'd think it would carry on going on that gradient and then suddenly we do this sort of 180 uh, so let's talk about field in england then because this is so this is is this your this is your favorite yeah this is my favorite um i love the performances i think the actors are all just perfect in it yeah it's incredible um, the dialogue is just fucking gorgeous. It really is. <laughs> I yeah, I really, really love it. It's a, it's just the right amount of oldie English. Uh, yeah, it's well, I... not impenetrable. But yeah, it feels very legitimate and proper. And then there's the, a, a small handful of modern versions of colloquialism yeah. that would have existed then. This place holds a great treasure. Now you will find the treasure in this field. Listen. I feel suddenly empty. He's coming! So, uh, Reese Shearsmith plays an appointed alchemist Mm -hmm. who has been uh, sent out into uh, a war zone, uh, which, while never overtly specified, seems like it's the Cromwell Royalist Wars. Yeah. uh, The British Civil Wars. Um, uh, Which, incidentally, is acknowledged in High Rise, the BAFTA, that... uh, 
is on the on the shelf in the background of huh. High Rise is for a documentary called Crom's Soldiers. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. Amazing. Uh, yeah, he, he's been sent out into the battle. He decides it's all a bit much and he runs away from the battle and in mm. doing so he crosses through the hedgerow. And the hedgerow is sort of the, the first vanguard between the real world and the supernatural. So once he's yeah. into the field, which is this mushroom circle field, um, he's sort of in a different space, although he doesn't realise it immediately. Yeah. And he meets these these other people out in the field who are all there for various reasons, and they, they set off to <clears throat> initially try and find an alehouse that they think will offer them respite from mm. all the violence. Um, but they end up uh, getting embroiled with the... Um, the the um, alchemist that Reese had replaced, yes. played by Michael Smiley, and he sort of press gangs them into his own treasure hunt, where the alehouse is dismissed, and now they're after something something bigger. Yeah, it's out well, in the field because it's hilarious. Because you know, talking about it, it is like it's this kind of out there supernatural story, but it's also four blokes trying to find a pub. Essentially, is yeah. the setup as well, isn't it? Because um, when I when I first watched it, I I, I wasn't sure what you know, whether this was going into supernatural territory, whether it was psychological, whether I remember part of me thinking, okay, are they actually dead? Are they in some sort of weird afterlife world here? Is that what's happened? You know, and it's, I suppose, again, it's kind of deliberately... Like, like Kill List. Yeah. It's, uh, it's deliberately a little vague. Uh, I think I think it's vaguer than Kill List. It I is. Think it's, it's, a, it's a lot more oblique. I absolutely bloody love it. I think <laughs> it, everything about it is, yes. is is perfect for me. It's like it was made for me. Mm. Um, the, the music is just breathtaking. Yes, um, yes. The music. So first of all, the music. I mean, because again, folk horror, a big part of it is the music, actually. Oh yeah. You know, we've talked about it a lot. Obviously, the Wicker Man and that kind of thing. And this feels like it's got, again, it's very kind of, at least in my head, it feels authentic sounding music, you yeah. know, of the time yeah, yeah. And, and of this genre and everything else. Oh, the I'll keep my lonely watch Intent thy light is breath to catch oh, when Yeah, it's really nice. And obviously it's uh, like, so the actual, the non-diegetic music is yes. very like drums and military. There's a lot of like sort of very like tight animal skin type percussion yeah. going on. That like tinny thump. Yes. Uh, which is just so satisfying. And then yeah. there's a lot of a cappella. Mm. Um, stuff where the characters themselves sing. Uh, yeah, Richard, uh, who plays friend. Yeah, Baloo, um, my boy is oh Baloo, my boy. Yeah, his performances of that are just absolutely beautiful. It's wonderful. The sort of the the um, the 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 friendly idiot. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. What do you think? What's the what are the thoughts behind those moments where they break the fourth wall, where we've got the tableaus, where that kind of thing happens? You know, what's the re- what's the reasoning behind those moments? I it was Ben never stated. Yeah. what he meant by it. Mm. Um, it was quite fun being there for them. Yes. Because I think people hadn't expected them. <laughs> um, and I love that they're not freeze frames. No, the and, they, and they move and, and wobble. And they look a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. um, if you think at the time, obviously it's you know it's set in an era pre-photography. Yeah. If you wanted an image caught, you'd have to pose. Stand you'd have and to hold pose it. For it. You'd have to hold it. The, and it yeah. is. Uh, but then also, like Ben talks a lot about persistence of vision mm-hmm. uh, and the intercutting that happens during the psycho, like the freakout scene. Uh, yeah. Later is all about uh, like the editing is all about like playing with how the brain processes overlapping images and that kind of stuff. Yes. Uh, film as a concept, like the moving image, is a series of still images that the brain trans late into movement yeah because the brain exists working on persistence of of vision yeah and so the idea that that we have these characters at these key points in the yeah in the film just stop and you just absorb what's going on it's yeah. almost like a safe like a respite yeah from the from the chaos yeah it's interesting and it's true because and also you know that like you say, you know, there weren't photographs back then or anything else, and that it has a feel of an authentic, like a performance that you'd watch yeah. at that time, you know? Suddenly there'll be a break where someone will sing a song or, you know, someone will look towards the audience and say something, and it kind of has this kind of wacky, slapsticky humour at times as well. well. I think that ties into the kind of stuff that was going on at the time. If you exactly. look at Chaucer and Shakespeare and all that kind of stuff, when they do it comedy... It feels like Jacobean it's all, or... Yeah, it's all pokers up arses. And yeah, like suddenly the clown comes on or yeah, the porter or... Absolutely, and it, like yeah. it's all super lowbrow stuff, Yeah, but then juxtaposed with the super highbrow yeah. worthy, you know, the madness of the king kind of stuff. 
Um, and, and there was no middle ground. It's all very broad strokes, which again yeah. is like black and white. You've got you don't have all the detail of the color. Yes, it's about everything being one way or another. Yes, um, it I, looks gorgeous, doesn't it? Oh, Particularly really this it one. The cinematography really stands out. It was very interesting working on it because I because I did Human Centipede two, which was <laughs> did you? Yeah. Oh my god, I so didn't that, know that. <laughs> Amazing. That's that's for a future podcast. Um, yeah, you, if you do an extreme, a hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so because I did that, but we didn't know that was going to be in black and white when we shot it. Right. So loads of the effects we made, we did in a way that wasn't necessarily how you do it. Yeah. I think he has actually now released, uh, Tom has now actually released it in colour. No, I But I've not, I've not seen it in colour. Yeah. But um, I, I have a lot of time for a few minutes to do it. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I, I, it's, I think it's accidental masterpiece. Maybe? Yeah, I think it's the best of the three. Oh, like, you know, undeniably yeah. the best of the three. But I'd also, yeah, like I, I have a lot of time. I've, uh, I have on more than one occasion referred to it as our generation Salo. <laughs> well, yeah, um, that's exactly what it is. I think, I think that think is what it is. Yeah, whether, yeah. whether deliberately or not, whether yeah. it was planned or not. Um, Pasolini, when he made Salo, said, uh, "I want to make an unwatchable film. Yeah. <laughs> I want to make a film no one can stomach." Uh, yeah. And when I, I said to Tom, "Why are we spending money on these effects? You're, you're going to have to cut them out. No one's going to let you mm. put all this in." Yeah. And he laughed and he said, "Let them try and burn it." And it's very interesting because I was I've, like, I've, right, I've, "Challenge accepted." I've, yeah, exactly. I've talked about on the last series. I talked with someone from the BBFC actually, and we talked specifically about Human Centipede Two for a while and all the problems <laughs> that I had. Um, but anyway, yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I mean, so so Ben always had in his head that this was going to be black and white. Did he? Did yeah. he? Yeah. Yeah. It was always going to be black and white. Um, all the camera tests were done in black and white, and it was um, and it was very interesting going into it with the the experience of having done. You can't just turn up. So the the very famous example is the Frankenstein makeup, the Boris Karloff Frankenstein. Yes. We all see Frankenstein now. You know whether it's the monsters or whatever is yeah. green. Yeah. But he was only green because that was what looked like dead flesh on black and white film. It was right. never meant to be acknowledged as green. It was meant to be pale dead flesh. Yeah. But a colour still leaked its way out of the studio mm. and the green became the standard. Huh. Similarly, back in the old days, um, beards, fake beards, would have a, li- a line of um, flesh-coloured hair yeah. applied on the top edge to kind of blend them out. Yeah. It doesn't work on colour film, but yeah. makes beards look much, much better on black and white film. Yeah, yeah. Again, um, Jekyll and Hyde or... Um, uh, Black Sunday. Yeah. The uh, because it was in black and white, they could have them. They could have two different makeups applied to someone oh, in yeah, two different colors. The kind of the change and of then lenses. use a gradiated glass going from red to green, like a sort of one one eye anaglyph. Yeah, and then shift so you'd change from one makeup would fade out, one makeup fade in in camera to these amazing yeah, things. Yeah, it's wonderful. All of which are possible on black and white film, but none of which are possible on color. Yeah, um, and so yeah, everything has to be approached differently if you're working. But yeah. you also can't turn up with a fake head or a, you know whatever that looks completely alien to the actors because yes. they have to be able to interact with it. it has to feel real for them as well so it's a yeah it's a very interesting challenge it's very fun how different was it for you to sightseers as well in terms of because there's not a, there's not as much graphic content i suppose or or you know what what, what were kind of the, no, the big i think we so obviously you've got um <laughs> what what i refer to as sunshine through an irishman uh-huh. Uh, which is a reference to a DVD chapter on the old The Beyond disc. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sunshine for a little girl. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, yes. Yeah. You know what, I you, now know, you what, know what I'm talking about. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, so that's obviously probably, that's the most, probably the goriest, other than the close-up of Michael's knee after he gets shot with the mask. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's yeah, really yeah, horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was done like super old school we literally just strapped his leg up like an old pirate on stage and gave Brilliant. him a false leg that was pegged into the ground and then, and then when he leant forwards it. on it it would just yawn open great looks um, great uh, yeah it's horrible it's, yeah really <laughs> really good work it is horrible yeah. um, and then some fake cocks mm-hmm. uh, running some yeah. people through with spears <laughs> uh, those are Ferdinando's real testicles though are they? Yeah, they weren't going to be on camera and he was like this cock doesn't have any testicles. And it's like, well, because you were meant to be just getting Brilliant. it out over the, the top ha- of your trousers. Uh, does the cock have like, it's got like a little sore on it or it's something. It's got quite a lot it? of sores. It actually uh, yeah. had squeezable boils on it, but they, uh, we didn't hold on it. It's wonderful that moment when Reese's character just lists everything. <laughs> yeah. that he's got all of his ailments, you know. Am I bewitched? No. So you merely suffer a disease in the private parts occasioned by too much venereal sport. It is all. Well, I also deduce gout. Uh, bloody flux, a postum of the mouth, the pissing disease, uh, St. Anthony's fire, iliac passion, hemorrhoids and palsy brought on by drink. Then I'm not going to turn into a frog. Tis the one complaint you do not suffer, uh, besides plague. 
Uh, I love, I'm a huge fan of Reese Shearsmith as well. I, I mean, what was he that. like to work with? Was He's he... absolutely lovely. Yeah. Um, Reese is really, really nice. We, we sort of, uh, we sort of met up socially a couple of times after the, um, after the movie and yeah. he's just he's an absolutely lovely man he before he got into acting and writing he wanted to be a special effects artist oh, interesting. Uh, and so he had um, and, and uh, like a lot of uh, a lot of those guys uh, he also has um, an interest in magic as well yeah uh, yeah. So we took him along to a friend of mine has a magic venue. Oh, great! Cool. Um, chap called Simon Drake mm. had a TV show on Channel Four in the nineties yeah. called uh, Secret Cabaret. Oh, one, right. of the, one of the first horror magicians. Oh, cool! And yeah. I grew up watching his stuff, and he lives near here, so we oh, we ended oh, cool. up meeting and, and mm. became friends. And then I took Reese along to one of his shows, uh, to his uh, Halloween show, just after we did uh, Fields in England. Oh, nice! Um, and yeah, Reese was absolutely lovely. Such yeah. a nice guy. And again, if you've got that feeling with him, it's like with the, the rest of those guys and Ben as well that they they love film. They know their stuff oh, so well. Yeah, that's don't they? Really, that's another thing is that I can have a conversation with Ben about what he wants, and we can use referential shorthand. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You yeah, can yeah. have an entire conversation's worth of uh, information exchanged in a single moment because mm. it can be like, oh yeah, you know, like in this film. Yes, exactly. That's and what you want. And then I immediately know what he means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's the same. I bet I can imagine for Reese that was a dream come true kind of film and role for him because again, he seems to be such a fan of this kind of movie. Yeah, absolutely. This and he of- is exceptional in it. He they really all, is. The cast, all of the cast are amazing. They're so real. It was of One of the things I really enjoyed was uh, I, I rewatched. Um, uh, which find a general mm-hmm. uh, ahead of talking to you about this because mm. that was always Ben's kind of reference point, right? Interesting um, for that film, uh, for Field. And um, there is a there's a, a background actor who looks so much like Julian Barrett, <laughs> which find a general. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's interesting. What what is it about which found a which find a general specifically then that was kind of a uh, influence for Ben? Is it just is it that time period that look? Well, I think Michael is based on the Witchfinder. Ah, to some interesting. Extent. Like you look at his cloak and that beautiful shot when he comes out and like yeah. billows it out the behind way he looks. himself. Yeah, his aesthetic is. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's just it's one of the best, as, like as an aesthetic tone. Yeah, albeit. With a lot of slightly shonky day for night. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know. Why just, are you squinting against the night sky? <laughs> yeah. Just keep it all in daytime. Yeah, you know, it's much easier. Um, but yeah, I think it, it does have a sort of. You you can see that fits into Ben's worldview. Yeah, like it is about like the the evil that people can exact upon one another. Yeah, I think tone like actual mood wise, it's probably closer to Kill List. Yes, which one in general? It's really fucking horrible. Oh, much. Yeah, it's really really horrible. Yeah. Um. Again, it's got that real proper nihilism to it yeah. uh, you know which find a general yeah and the and, axe murder at the end when he says you took him from me when, yeah. when one of them s- he, he compassionately shoots the yeah, man that ending to stop him from being butchered further with an axe and then it just cuts to credit so it's and like then, where, then it goes to the crying wife who's not yet but he's so cross that he's had his revenge taken from him he doesn't untie his wife yes <laughs> And then it cuts to her screaming face, and then and, it, then and then it goes to posterized image of like a two tone of yeah, her face, and I the credits that. roll over that. Oh, it's so good. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Whereas actually, yeah, Field in England tonally, so tonally, this film is so strange, and it yeah. has, like we say, it's got that mix of kind of wacky comedy, you know, but also truly, truly terrifying moments as well. I mean, do you see this as a horror movie? It's only very peripherally. Yeah. It's not like, so the horror from Kill List and the yes. folk from Fields in England. Yes. Uh, and then to a lesser extent, like some of the uh, imposition of ideology from sightseeing. Yeah. And the kind of Britishness, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. And, and the innate Britishness. Although yeah. I think the other two are also super British. Yes, they are. Cool. Um, they all sort of equal a equal one folk horror movie yeah it's really interesting the um i mean we've got to talk about the the, the one moment that everyone talks about in a field in england is that strange Risha smith on a rope coming out oh, of the tent it so moment much. yeah What is going on there in that human divination? Yeah. So is it that he's been kind of hypnotized or cast a spell over? Well, there's a or... there's a shot that we did. Um, I think it's in the film. I literally watched it last night. Yeah. I, the the reason I'm doubting myself is because I mentioned it to someone else and they didn't remember it. Well, you might um, have memories of yourself being on set with well, that's it. And, it. Yeah. But he vomits up those uh, the rune stones, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's about the idea that he is innately part of the the 
the puzzle. Yes, I because it's, it's, you know, Michael Smiley talks to him like you're crucial to yeah. you, you yourself are, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, like, weirdly, I think a lot of it actually triggers some of the stuff I like about Hellraiser. Yeah. Because it is about unlocking this this code yeah and when reese tries to leave and he comes to the the mushroom circle mm. and he's there just forcing he these, these all, magic yeah. mushrooms into his mouth and that kind of like makes him super powerful yeah because he's able to unlock that third eye in a way yeah. that gives him power over my yeah. smiley then i shall become it i shall consume all the ill fortune which you are set to unleash oh it's wonderful it is and and again it's like somehow you know you 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 get the feeling you're not watching something designed specifically to be a horror movie like we said but there are moments in it like that image on the rope or just some of the other bits towards the end of after reese has eaten the uh of the mushrooms and the way he kind of looks towards the camera and moves around they're just these truly kind of uncanny unsettling images that he manages to sort of tap into something yeah within it's us. really nice ben talks about having been at like uh, in front of two VHS editing decks when he was young mm. and just having two streams of information and just tap, 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 yeah. tap, back and forth between the two sets of images. And that persistence of vision, which I mentioned earlier, yeah. like forces your brain to try and acknowledging try and acknowledge both. So rather than like shortcuts between dozens and dozens of things where you're just taking tiny bits of information, mm. you've got two separate streams of data inf- of, of data coming into the mind. Yeah, it um, works. It kind of still flows. It doesn't feel jarring or something in a weird yeah, way. Yeah, but it feels... It's like... Um, it's like when VR isn't in focus. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Or when you, you're crappy 3D or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And you, you, you're like, you feel like, oh, then, no, this is wrong. I don't like this. Yeah. Something's ha- but it doesn't feel unreal. Yeah. But it, it, it's uncanny. And yes, stuff. exactly. And there are moments as well. Did he do something where the it's like the grass was moving faster than the people walking on it or something? Or is that just my about, head? just about frame rate. Right. It's like when a helicopter blade appears to be going backwards. It's yes, a, yes, yes. I couldn't tell if that was an effect or not, but I just, you, I just, I love just looking at everything in I can't film. say with 100% certainty that it isn't yeah, but yeah, yeah. to my knowledge it isn't yeah that's so good it's so good anything else you want to um, mention about Fields in England uh, the first time I watched it I thought I wasn't going to be able to attend the cast and crew screening because uh, I had work and then that ended up not happening so I was able to go but because I didn't think I was going to be able to go. Ben invited me to the DCP check um, up at the hospital club. Ah, nice. So I went along very, very early in the morning um, to go to that. And that ended up being uh, myself, Reese, um, uh, Ferdinando, and uh, Julian Barrett was there as well, mm-hmm. uh, and Ben and, and Andy. And we watched it there. But they had it way too loud oh god and i had a stinking hangover oh no every single one of those gunshots ripped my spine out through my mouth oh god it's the best way to watch it Ah, well funnily (laughs) enough that's what i found the first time i watched free fire is how powerful those gunshots were every time yeah watching it seeing the cast and crew and then seeing it again uh uh later uh, it was yeah, it was really beautiful and powerful. Those gunshots were so strong. Mm. And then I also saw it just on general release, and they just turned it down. Ah, oh. and I was like, "What the fuck are what you doing? doing? Yeah, 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 you want to be like feel like you're being punched in the face every time a gun goes off. God, and so your teeth rattle. So was that the first time at the hospital club you'd seen a field in England? Yeah, and it's and and did you? Were, were you surprised at all? I mean, did you have any idea in your head what this film was going to look like? Well, I mean, I, I knew. Obviously, I've been on set. I'd seen yeah. the costumes. I'd seen the performances. I'd seen playback on monitor. Right. We yeah, knew we were yeah, shooting yeah. in black and white. Like, there were some surprises, mm. but I think it was everything I wanted it to be, yeah. and I had had faith that it would be everything I wanted it to be. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't shocking in that way, mm-hmm. but I was delighted certainly. It's wonderful. And then just quickly, I mean, the, the way it was released was quite interesting and unique at the time, wasn't it? It sort of came on television, on VOD yeah. and cinemas all at the same time, didn't it? Is that yeah. right? And it feels like that happens quite a lot now with a lot of kind of smaller movies. But Yeah, there's a, they sort of set the way for that. And I yeah. think it was certainly interesting. Um, it played at the, played at a bunch of cinemas at exactly the same time. Mm. And then it also broadcast on film four at the same time. Was this something to do with just because it was more of an inherently kind of niche movie than something like Sightseeing? Is, so they thought it's you know it's yes and also it was didn't cost nearly as much as sightseers yeah uh, so it wasn't as much of a gamble yeah uh, film four one of the main financiers so yeah. they had the rights to the first dis- to the first uh, showing mm-hmm. and so they chose to tie it in in that way so it was literally released for media sale 
and then cinema and film all at the same time. Mm. Um, previously, the first, the, the the last film to try something close to that was Steven Soderbergh's Bubble. Yes, um, which was the first film where you could uh, had they didn't have TV release, but they had day and date for the um, for the DVD. Right. Yeah. And they were literally said at the end of the film, if you enjoyed the movie and you want to watch it again, it's for sale Get it now. on DVD in the yeah. foyer of the cinema. And the American cinema like cineast association or whatever it is the, the people that run the cinemas were absolutely fucking livid they mm. hated it and they've always been the ones pushing for that window yeah it's to interesting to preserve it yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah I think it did it did well I it needs a good sound system it needs a big screen it does it's it's it, it's, it's interesting what they did with the release but I think that the people who watched it at the cinema and the people who watched it at home on like a you know 20 inch yeah yeah you're not gonna stereo, get stereo f- yeah it's not the same movie and it definitely deserves to be seen on in as in a bigger screen as possible. Yeah, definitely. You just kind of let it sort of wash over you, don't you? In oh, a way, yeah, you know, it is, it is hypnotic. Well, it's a tri- it, it is literally like a trip. It's, it's yes. genuinely great. And I know that, like, I think it's it undermines it to say that it's a drugs movie because I don't think it's just them on drugs. No, no. Like you don't you hesitate not, to want to label it as that. Yeah, really, exactly. Don't you? Yeah, but it does have that kind of feel. Yeah, but not. I, I don't know. I don't think it feels so much like mushrooms as it feels like morphine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I had a motorbike crash in my teens mm. and had to be put under general anaesthetic for an operation on my leg. Mm. And the uh, the sensation of of counting backwards and, and being put under before they opened me up. Yes. Oh my yeah, God. it's not that dissimilar. Oh my <laughs> to God. The feeling of falling backwards into uh, into your seat as you watch Field in England. Field in England, yeah, wonderful. Um, so obviously since then, Ben has done, you know, bigger and bigger projects really. You know, he's gone to, High Rise was, was big and it had, you know, Jeremy Irons and all these big kind of Tom Hiddleston yeah. and then obviously Free Fire as well, which was Martin Scorsese exec produced yeah, it, yeah. you know, so he's kind of hit the big time now, you know, you know, even more so. Um, he do you think he's ever going to go back and do any movies in the ilk of Kill List or Field in England he, he, again? He literally just did Colin Uanus, right. which is an adaptation of Coriolanus. Amazing. Um, and was shot over a fortnight in Brighton, very much like Dan Terrace. It's in, wonderful. You know, very fast run and gun. I've not seen it yet. Mm. Um, and as I said earlier, I, sadly there wasn't any work for me on it, so I haven't I didn't get to be on set either. In fact, I, I just finished doing um, In Fabric, the new Peter Strickland movie, yeah. oh which he's an ex- Ben's an exec on. Yeah, uh, Ab, Andy Stark uh, was on set with us for most of that because Rook, Ben's company, Ben and Andy, and yeah. Pete Toombs' company, um, produced it. Uh, so I just finished that, and then Colin went straight away after yeah. that. But um, yeah, like I said, there wasn't anything for me on it. So, but the thing is, Ben has so many irons in the fire. Yeah, like, the, and there are so many things about to go. Yeah, like I got told about. I got told about um, Freak Shift. Oh yeah, on the set of Sightseers. And Freak Shift is another one of his upcoming yeah, projects. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, fingers crossed it goes ahead next year. Uh, we've had some amazing cast attached, and then, you know, things have happened. Things yeah. have gone, haven't gone. Um, ben describes it as um, women with shotguns versus crabs. Great. Um, he's also <laughs> described it as Doom meets Hill Street Blues. Great. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Uh, we've done three sets of tests for it over about five years. Okay. Uh, two different big visual effects houses, mm. um, and then some stunt work as well. So we've done creature suits. We've done, yeah, wire work. It's it's really exciting, and I'm hoping it's it's going to go. But then you know he's got uh, he's got loads of exciting stuff. Silk Road still looks like it might happen. Mm-hmm. His HBO thing with mm-hmm. Scorsese. Um, is he going to do Hard Boiled or something? Or yes, that is. Apparently he's on that. He's also written a screenplay for the remake of um, Wages of Fear. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm very excited about, about yeah. One of my favourite films of all time. Amazing. So, he's got a lot of God balls in the air. involved in that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure you will yeah, be. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff. So it's amazing. It's and about it's, what goes first. And it's great that he still, he, he, he then gets the time in between to make these little, you know, shoot in two weeks in Brighton type yeah. movies as well. You know, it's yeah. wonderful. Um, fantastic. Well, I mean, it's, it's been great I feel like these movies you could talk about each one for like an hour plus yeah, but yeah. Um, we should move on um, thank you so much for joining me Dan not at all it's lovely to, lovely to be back yeah really really great um, so tell me where, where can people find you online and, and, and Arrow Video Podcast and that kind um, of thing so yeah uh, iTunes and SoundCloud and so on yeah. the Arrow Video Podcast uh, which I do with Sam Ashurst my co-host yes uh, who I think has done a couple of these and is going to be yes. doing another one yes. for, yeah, yeah, yeah. for this um, and then uh, on Twitter I'm at 13 Finger FX. Uh, same on Instagram, you know, shout, All the usual. shout at me about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so, so much. Thanks so much.
And that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. And once again, a huge thank you to the brilliant Dan Martin. There's no one better I could have had with me discussing those three movies. Now, you may have heard if you follow Dan on social media, but something quite exciting that Dan is involved with has actually been announced since we recorded that episode. That's why it wasn't mentioned during the chat. But he and his wife, the brilliant Jen Handoff, who has also been on the podcast before, have recently announced the upcoming opening of something called Fright Night Club. This is going to be, according to them, London's first and only immersive horror experience. For the month of October, Jen and Dan will be opening the doors to a secret Bermondsey location and inviting everyone to dive into a world like no other. Now, there's loads of information about this online. They've actually got a website. It's www.frightnightclub.com. Sounds like it's going to be something really, really special. And also, in the next few weeks, I am going to be joined by both Dan and Jen together to have a little chat about what Fright Night Club is actually going to be, what people can expect and how this idea was born. So expect to hear more from Dan and Jen very soon. But in the meantime, what do you think of those Ben Wheatley movies? Do you agree or disagree with our takes? Get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at evolutionpod, on Instagram at the evolution of horror or on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash evolution of horror. There is also a discussion group for filled with wonderful people in which you can discuss the movies, discuss the horror genre, anything you like. That can be found on Facebook, the Evolution of Horror discussion group. And don't forget you can also follow us on Letterboxd and that's where we keep constantly updating lists of what movies we're going to be covering later on in the series. So you can keep up to date, create your own watch list and see all the movies in advance. So, where do we go from here? Well, there's still plenty more interesting modern folk horror movies to cover. And next week, it's going to be one of my absolute favourites. A stone-cold modern horror classic. And one of the scariest movies, in my opinion, of recent years. So next week, I am going to be joined once again by the brilliant Louise Blaine. Last series, she was here discussing both The Shining and The Conjuring with me. And she's going to be back to discuss with me one of her favourites and mine. We are going to be talking about Robert Eggers' 2015 masterpiece, The Witch. Um, That's the only movie we're going to be discussing, and it's going to be a deep dive. We're going to be going full spoilers with this. So I would urge you, if you haven't seen The Witch, please, please give yourself a treat. Seek it out and watch it. I hope you will not be disappointed. I think it's an absolute bona fide modern horror classic, and I cannot wait to discuss it. So join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.